It's a, a really wonderful thing to be apostolic in uh, lifestyle and in doctrine. Pentecost is an experience. It dates back to the day of Pentecost, 2,000 years ago. Apostolic is a broader word than Pentecost. Pentecost is an experience. Pentecost to some is a denomination, not to us. It's an experience. But apostolic encompasses teaching and doctrine and lifestyle and power and principle. And so uh, we're apostolic and Pentecostal, and we're very glad about that. And uh, I, I want to tell you that the apostolic church has always done best when it wasn't looking around trying to take its cues from everybody else, everywhere else in culture. The apostolic church has always done best when it just got in the presence of God and followed the word of God and obeyed the principles of God's word. It's only when the church has ever glanced sideways for direction that we've ever lost our way. Taking cues from culture has never helped the church. Uh, becoming religiously relevant has never blessed the apostolic church. Striving for social acceptance has never grown the apostolic church. It may grow other kinds of religious movements, but it doesn't grow the apostolic church. In fact, I would say very firmly, it's only when we've reached back to our roots that we've ever made huge strides forward in God. We talk about progress in the church, and we want to progress, and we want to grow, and we want God to do wonderful things here in our midst, and here in our church, and here in our city, and far beyond. But uh, sometimes what we call progress, really what it is, is getting back to the basics. When the apostolic church worships and prays and sacrifices, when the apostolic church reaches and teaches and preaches, that's when we grow. Now, the early church... They weren't concerned one iota about fitting in. Uh, they were concerned about standing out and standing up and standing strong. And so in that first century, the, the methods of the apostolic church were incredibly inclusive. They wanted everybody to belong. Everybody was welcome. But the message that they preached was unbelievably uh, exclusive you were either apostolic or you weren't. You either believed what Jesus and the apostles taught or you didn't. It wasn't fuzzy like it is today. It wasn't blurry like it is today. It was very plain. It was the words of Scripture or it was nothing. Long before there were terms like Christian or Pentecostal or apostolic, the early church, in fact, referred to itself as the way. And Luke uses that term a half dozen times in the book of Acts. Two or three years ago, we did a series called The Way. Because that idea wasn't original with the church. It came from the words of Jesus himself when he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus was very exclusive. You either come this way or you don't get in to the kingdom at all. And so because he said, I'm the way, then the disciples, they referred to the church as the way. And that's why the early Christians were persecuted. They were called heretics in the first century. Um, here's what Paul said when he was on trial in Acts 24. But this I confess unto thee, that after the way, somebody say the way, after the way which they call heresy, that's how I worship the God of my fathers. And I believe all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Paul said, I believe in what the Old Testament reveals. I believe in what the prophets and what the law was pointing to, and that's Jesus Christ. And I follow him. He said, I am the way. So Paul said, I belong to this group called the way. Now, when you call yourself the way, you're automatically saying that that way is right and other ways are wrong. And they didn't back up from that. And it's much the same today. If you say there's one way to God and you don't allow for any fuzziness or any blurriness in that, people will call you a heretic today. Because today, they want all roads and all opinions uh, to lead to God because that makes it easy for everybody. 
And uh, that, that's how it is. It was the same way in the first century, however. And so they called themselves the way. Anybody that says the way, uh, that's pretty exclusive. And that's exactly how they were. But I've got to tell you that the apostolic church did just fine in the first century. Thank you very much. They did great. They grew. They had revival. Uh, people were one to God. And I would suggest to you that the apostolic church has always done its best when it wasn't looking around. Every time we've obeyed the word instead of the flesh, we've been blessed. Every time we've submitted to God instead of submitting to the ways of the world, we've seen God's glory. And every time we've followed the spirit instead of following the trend or following the crowd, that's when the church actually ends up setting the pace. Now, you are seated tonight, and we're just a small group in a small city in one corner of North America, but you are seated among the descendants of the people who brought a move of the Spirit and a tidal wave of worship back to the dead, formal church world that had lost its way about 110 years ago. Now, every denomination now in North America has little pockets of people who speak in tongues, who operate in in the prophetic, who sing with exuberance, who preach with some kind of anointing, who worship with some measure of abandon. Every denomination has that. Some denominations call that their contemporary service, and some have just given up and said, that's how we're going to do church. And however they do it, that's wonderful, but it wasn't always like that. Our grandparents who were Pentecostal, our great-grandparents who were Pentecostal, they weren't liked back then. And it wasn't popular to speak in tongues. You were weird and wacky and probably demon-possessed if you talked in tongues uh, back a few decades ago. And not every church thought it was okay to lift your hands. Not every church thought it was okay to clap your hands. Now, so many of them do. Every denomination today in North America has little pockets of those people if it's not the whole denomination. But if it hadn't been for the apostolic church who restored the church to first century fervor just over a century ago, every church group in North America today would just be a mere shadow of what it is as far as worship and as far as all of these other things. The apostolic church of which we're part, thankfully part of, it began in the first century. It continued at Azusa Street 110 years ago. And the apostolic church has always led the way when they listened to God. Uh, you, you can talk about just about any issue. If you talk about racial equality, the apostolic church led the way when uh, there wasn't much racial equality in the United States where Azusa Street was happening. But one way I want to talk to you about tonight, uh, and I don't know why this is. I, I think it's because about uh, exactly a month ago, actually, it was the last day of February. I was on my way uh, to a, a meeting in, in uh, Texas, in San Marcos, Texas. And it was a, a women's conference. And I woke up early that morning because uh, there's no way to get out of Fredericton on a plane unless you get up early in the morning. And I get up early. And this, is, this hasn't happened to me forever. In fact, never has it happened exactly this way. But I, I woke up in bed and I was laying there and just some thoughts started rolling through my mind and I got ready and I got my carry-on packed and I headed to the airport and, and I got there early enough that I just sat inside security and uh, I just started writing stuff down and I really felt like God uh, just tied a bunch of threads together that I had studied before. Some of them I've preached here before. Uh, but it, it just like it just opened up and I felt like it was for uh, that particular meeting. It was a women's conference that I had to speak at, which was a, an unusual thing. Uh, two, two meetings that I uh, get to do from time to time, women's conferences and youth camps. I think those are really funny, but I still do them uh, because somehow it makes me feel young on one side. I'm not sure if I'm getting in touch with my feminine side with the others or what's going on. But we had a powerful move of God. There were a thousand ladies. Beverly would not go with me on that one, but she's going to another one in, in a few weeks in Wisconsin. I'm glad. And she's, uh, she's going to be preaching and, and she's been studying and thank God she's been studying because it just kind of, uh, never mind. If I study five minutes to preach five minutes, 
she studies five hours to preach five minutes. She's the real deal. Um, here, here's the thing. Um, I, I, I just had never seen it quite this way. I've studied all these things. You'll recognize some of them. But God had never tied them together. And I took it to that meeting and we had a powerful move of God. And I came home, and of course, I wanted to preach it to you that very next week, and, and it just wasn't the right time. And, and finally, uh, early this morning, kind of got the, 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 the green light to, to share it tonight. Um, one of the ways the apostolic church has always set the pace is um, seeing women as equals. Now, we don't think that because we've been polluted by our culture that tells us that the church that it, it kind of uh, downplays and downtrods women and nothing could be further from the truth. If you went back to the first century, the first century church was the first group to see women as equals. And that was in a culture where women were considered property. And the first century church included women in ministry. The only way the church ever got off track was when they started looking around at what society was doing and mimicking that instead of doing what God's word said. In Jesus' day, now, now this is radical, and we don't think it is because today we live in North America and, and, and women, uh, they have so many freedoms here in Canada and we're grateful for all of that and it should be that way, but we think this has always been this way and it hasn't always been this way. But we also think, because of uh, talking heads on television, we also think that the church has kind of held back and put on the brakes and tried to keep women down when all the time it was Jesus and the first century church that lifted women up above uh, what they were allowed to be in that society. In Jesus' day, women were considered the source of all evil. Because in the, the, the theological thinking of that day, women represented sexual temptation. Women represented the original sin of their forebearer, Eve. And because women were valued only for their subservient role as wives and mothers, when Jesus came along, women were not even allowed to be taught by rabbis. Basically, women were seen as inferior servants. And in the thinking of the day, their place was in the field, at the well, or in the kitchen. And if they ever left their houses, they were expected in most places to be veiled. They weren't allowed to talk to men in public except their own husbands. And a woman was not permitted to testify in a court of law since the witness of a woman 2,000 years ago was considered untrustworthy. Why? Because she's a woman. Now that's the society that Jesus came to. And that is the society that the first century church started in. It was in that context that Jesus came. And don't you ever let anybody tell you that Jesus puts down women. Jesus was the first women's liberator. He preached a message of unrestricted access and acceptance before God. It's not radical to us today. We live in Canada. We're a free country. But it was radical when Jesus brought that message. We take for granted how revolutionary Jesus Jesus was. He elevated women in a society that degraded them. And so what seemed like normal actions to us, Jesus ministering to a woman, Jesus forgiving a woman caught in adultery, Jesus talking to an anonymous woman at a well, all of those seemed like normal things to us. They were actually dramatic, revolutionary acts in a culture in which it was inappropriate for a man even to speak with a woman in public. Now, here's what you see in the Gospels that's so radical and so different. And please don't miss it, especially you ladies. And I dedicate Bible study to you tonight. And I don't know why. It should be an Easter Bible study. Sunday's Easter, but it's not an Easter Bible study. So this is a, a let's call this a ladies Bible study, okay? And all the guys and pastor, we can listen in. But last night, one of the most exciting things that we did at business meeting was for the first time in our church history, uh, we're a little behind the envelope and, and behind the curve on this, but we put a couple of ladies on our church board last night, and the person that's most excited about that is standing right here because I think it's wonderful. And I, I told... Uh, 
I told our existing church board the other night, I absolutely hate to quote Justin Trudeau, but <laughs> somebody asked him why he was doing something, and he said it's because it's 2018. Well, that's why we did that last night, and I'm thrilled. But our ladies bring so very much to the apostolic church. It's unbelievable. Everywhere you look in the Gospels, you see a host of women who have equal access to Jesus, the same as the men. There's Mary who sat at his feet. And Jesus said, one thing is needful, and this lady has chosen the good part. She's the one that I want you to pay attention to. There's the sinful woman who anointed Jesus' feet, and Jesus said, her sins, which are many, are forgiven her. There's the woman of Canaan who desired a crumb from the master's table. And Jesus said, oh, woman, great is thy faith. He commended her above everyone else. There's the woman of Samaria. She met Jesus at the well and Jesus looked at her. That woman, we don't even know her name, but Jesus said, the father is looking for people just like you, sister, to worship him in spirit and in truth. Everywhere you look in the gospels, Jesus is looking at women and he's lifting them up and he's exalting them. Then there's the woman who had an alabaster box and Jesus, when she broke that and she poured it over his feet and she wiped his feet with her tears and with her hair, he said, wherever this gospel is preached, they're going to remember not this man, this woman. They're going to remember her. Wherever they preach about me, sometime they'll get around to preaching about that event. And when they do, they'll have to lift up this particular woman and mention her. Wherever the gospel is preached, they'll preach about her. And then there was the woman taken in adultery. And in a culture when, yeah, both of them were guilty, the man and the woman. But it sure seemed like the woman bore the brunt and the shame and the brutality and the embarrassment way more than the man. They didn't even bring him to Jesus. They let him off scot-free. They caught her in the very act of adultery. That means they should have at least, to be fair, brought both of them to Jesus. They didn't even bother. Because in that society, it was easy to pick on a woman and put her down. Jesus never did that, ladies. Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn thee, go and sin no more. And we live in a society where the statistics are still skewed. There's a lot of abuse in our society. But if you study it very much or very long, you'll find out that the abuse statistics are so skewed. And so many young women that come among us and they, they, they want to live for God and they have a shattered past and they're hurting because they've been misused and they've been abused. And they bear the brunt of that and they feel the shame of that. And I want to stand here as a pastor in this congregation and say, Jesus' words to you are the same as our words to you. We don't condemn you. Jesus can help you, Jesus can lift you, Jesus can forgive you, and Jesus can give you power to go and sin no more, but we're not in the business of condemning people. Jesus wasn't, and we're not. Amen. Jesus even welcomed women among his disciples. The Bible says, and certain women, Mary, Joanna, Susanna, and many others, it says that in, in Luke chapter 8. And so that's why the church in the first century adopted this radical new way of relating to each other. They worked with each other. They served God together, men and women. And if you read the book of Acts, which is the history of the formation of the early church, here's what you'll see. Acts 1.14, they were in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary. Acts 2.17, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Acts 5, 14. There were added to the, to, to the Lord multitudes both of men and women. That was the start of the church 
in Jerusalem. Acts 16, 13, they spake to the women which resorted thither. That was the start of the church in Philippi. Acts 17, 4, a great multitude and of the chief women, not a few. That was the start of the church in Thessalonica. Acts 17, 12, many of them believed also of honorable women. That was the start of the church in Berea. Literally everywhere in the book of Acts that a church was started and we know anything about it, there were women in the formation of that church. Our church is no different. We have great godly women who have preached to us, who have taught us, who have taught our children, who have led our young people, who have filled these altars, who've taught Bible studies, who've been prayer warriors, who've stood in this pulpit, who've been in these pews, who lift their hands, who bring an incredible anointing and presence of God into our midst. And I just want to stand here tonight and say, I thank God for the ladies that are part of this church. I know this is an unusual topic for Bible study, but we're going somewhere. But I thank God that we've got women in every area of this church. Their ministry and their anointing is spectacular, and it is so powerful, and I thank God for it. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, thy grandmother Lois, Timothy, and thy mother Eunice, you wouldn't be who you are if it wasn't for godly women. Romans 16 verse 1, I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister. Romans 16 3, greet Priscilla and Aquila, my helpers. They even list Priscilla before her husband Aquila. And we think that's because she was the better preacher. That's why. It's everywhere in the New Testament. And then there's this one, Galatians 3.28. In Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And I would stand here one more time and say that we were doing that before anybody else was doing that. Jesus started that. And the only time the church has ever stumbled is when we started looking around to our culture and taking our cues from culture. The apostolic church has always done its best when it wasn't looking around. Beginning in the first century, continuing at Azusa Street, we led the way in seeing women as equals and including them in ministry. We only stumble when we stop to look around at what everybody else in society is doing. So ladies, don't let the world tell you what it means to be an apostolic woman. Let the Bible tell you what it means to be an apostolic woman. Now, we are going somewhere tonight. Since Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15, there has been what the Bible calls enmity between the woman and the serpent. The curse of Genesis 3.16 says that the woman would forever have pain in childbearing. But the blessing of 1 Timothy 2.15 tells us that the woman would be saved in childbearing. She has pain in childbearing, but the woman would have, uh, she would be saved in childbearing. You know why? Because a woman gave birth to the Messiah. So since the opening pages of the word of God, the devil has feared and the devil has hated godly women, what we would call mothers in Israel. Paul, he had a surrogate mother. He says this in Romans 16, 13, greet Rufus, who's chosen in the Lord, also his mother, who has been a mother to me as well. Paul said, uh, it's his mom, but his mom has been like a mom to me. Now, some of you that are relatively new at CCC, you know exactly what that means because there's some precious little lady that she's mothered you while you've been young in the Lord, and she's prayed for you, and she's talked to you, and you know exactly what Paul was talking about. I mentioned this last Mother's Day. William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, said, some of my best men are women. I love that quote. But while the sexes are equal in standing before God, they are different by God's design in how they wage spiritual warfare. And spiritual warfare started first with the woman. It was a woman named Eve who first engaged in battle with the devil 
on the three battlefields that I want to talk to you about in the next few moments. Her battle is the oldest battle in the Bible. It started between the devil and the woman. Genesis 3 is the setting. Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, hath God said, You shall not eat of the tree of the garden? He's questioning what God gave them as a command. And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of, midst of the garden, God said about that tree, You shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. And the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die. For God, God's just jealous of you. God just doesn't want you to be all you can be. God just doesn't want you to, to, to grow or to have knowledge. God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then your eyes shall be open and you will be as God's knowing good and evil. Do you know the devil hasn't changed that lie in 6,000 years? The devil's still trying to tell people that if you follow God's way, it's restrictive. If you follow God's way, it'll chafe you. If you follow God's way, you'll be limited. And if you'll just ignore God's command, you can grow. You can be like God. You can have knowledge. You can have fun. You can have a great life. He hasn't changed that tired lie in 6,000 years. And then, this is, this is where we're going tonight. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, everyone say good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes. Everyone say the eyes. And it was a tree to be desired to make one wise. Everyone say desired. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Now, three battlefields. If you were to graph that out on a chart, it would look like this. Three temptations that Eve faced in the Garden of Eden. Three temptations. She faced these temptations. The, the devil put in front of her something that was pleasant to the eyes. He put in front of her something that was good for food. And he put in front of her something that was desired to make one wise. So three temptations or three battlefields. And Eve, the woman, is the very first one to face this battle with the devil. And, and I've got to tell you, this is the bad news. Adam and Eve, both of them, not her, not him, but together, both of them lost this battle on all three fronts. They yielded to all of those temptations, and the resulting carnage still affects every man and woman, boy and girl today, everybody, everywhere. Now, many years later, the Apostle John would write, and he would identify the three battlefields that war against the spiritual life of every Christian. Here's what he would say. 1 John 2, verse 15. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Here's why. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. You can't have both at the same time. They, they won't counterbalance. They won't coexist. Uh, they, they're at war with each other. So you've got to choose. It's always about choosing when you serve God. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now watch this. The same three temptations that Adam and Eve messed up John said, these are what everybody faces. You face them, I face them. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, those are your three battlefields, everybody in this room. Uh, that is not of the Father, that's of the world. If you yield, you're doing something worldly. If you yield, you're doing something self-destructive. But if you resist, if you conquer, if you win the battle, then God has his way in your life. Those things are not of the, world, of the Father, but they're of the world. And the world is passing away. The world isn't going to be around here for another two, three thousand years. The world is right now passing away, and the lust thereof is passing away. But he that doeth the will of God, he abides forever. So, so every day we have these choices. You can do what the world tempts you to do, and that is passing away. And, and you become 
part of the world system. You become part of the worldly mentality and you lose those battles and it diminishes you as a person. It diminishes your spiritual life. Or you can choose to be a person who does the will of God. Do you know you don't have to understand every commandment of God to obey the commandments of God? You you don't have to understand completely to begin obeying immediately because uh, there's a, a beautiful blessing for just simple obedience. And so those that do the will of God, they abide forever. Now, if you took those three things that John just identified for us, and if you put them on the same chart, it would look like this. Uh, John said, there's the lust of the eyes. That corresponds to the temptation Eve and Adam faced in the Garden of Eden, that it was pleasant to the eyes. He said, you're going to face the lust of the flesh. Well, that lust of the flesh is that it was good for food. It would feed the flesh. And finally, uh, the pride of life, John said. Well, that was, it was desired to make one wise. And so those three temptations, those three battlefields are what every Christian faces even today. Now, the greatest news in all of Scripture, and we'll celebrate it this Sunday. So this is my Easter plug in a Bible study that is definitely not an Easter Bible study. We'll celebrate it on Sunday. Jesus came as the second Adam. Adam lost the battle. Eve lost the battle. But Jesus came as the second Adam, and he went into the wilderness to be tempted for the very purpose of being tempted and in the wilderness, weak in the flesh, but strong in the spirit, worn out after 40 days of fasting and prayer, but strong in the spirit. Jesus won every single battle. And I'm so thrilled that he did. And I'm even more thrilled that Jesus didn't face these three temptations and lose uh, the battle And I'm also grateful that he faced these three temptations and he didn't win the battle by using his divine power. Because if he'd used his divine power, I couldn't replicate that. If he'd used his divine power, you couldn't imitate that. So if he had beat the devil as God, that doesn't help us. But Jesus beat the devil fair and square with every temptation. Uh, He beat the devil by quoting the word of God, standing on the principle of the word of God. And that's something that you and I can definitely do. So he gave us a pattern. By the way, it wouldn't have been news if God had beat the devil in the wilderness in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. That would not have been news. God beat the devil and kicked him out of heaven in eternity past. So that's an old victory. God won that a long time ago. But what's new about the wilderness is now it's God robed in flesh and Jesus is giving us a pattern. Now, I'm going to take Luke's account of it. Luke in chapter 4 He talks about this second Adam. And and in Luke chapter 4, the Bible says Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost and and he was led of the Spirit into the wilderness and he's tempted of the devil. And uh, we... we, uh, We know these temptations. They're familiar to us, but there's an incredible parallel here. First of all, the devil comes to him and says, you're hungry, Jesus. You, You need to make these stones into bread. And you know the story. Jesus said... It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. That's what Jesus said. You can do that. I can stand when the devil is trying to draw me away and I can say, uh, I'm not living by that. I'm not going to give my energy to that. I'm not going to give my allegiance to that. I live by every word of God. I don't just live by what pleases my flesh. So I can do that. I can't wipe the devil out like God could, but I can do that. And then the devil comes next. And if you continue on reading down through uh, Luke's account in chapter 4, the devil takes Jesus up into a high mountain. And he said, I'll give you all of this if you'll just bow and worship me, if you'll just do that. And Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Now, again, I can't do what God could do to destroy the devil. 
But I can beat the devil by doing that. I can say when the devil shows me things and he tries to put things in front of my eyes that are attractive to me, put things in front of my eyes that that would pull me off course spiritually, I can do exactly what Jesus did. Devil, get behind me. I'm not looking at that. I worship God only. I don't worship you. I don't worship the things of the world. I don't worship what you're putting in front of my eyes. I only only worship God. Now, I can do that, and you can do that. And then finally, the devil takes Jesus up into uh, the temple, to the pinnacle of the temple, and, and challenges him. You, you need to jump off, and, and if you jump off, the angels of God will come, and they'll bear you up. And Jesus says, when the devil is trying to tempt his ego, if you jump, God will protect you. If you jump, you'll be okay, because you're spiritual, and you're God, and, and, and you can do this. And when the devil tries to tempt Jesus with his pride, the, Jesus says, uh, it is is written. He said, it is said, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. And at some level, folks, it all comes down to that. Devil, get out of my face. If you're going to tempt me with that, I refuse the temptation. I'm going to go do something else. The Bible says that God will always make a way of escape when you are in an hour of temptation. All you've got to do is learn, instead of running headlong into the temptation and getting in trouble, you've got to learn to look around and look for the door of escape. Look for the escape path. God built it into every temptation you face. But nobody can make up your mind for you. Nobody can give you the uh, internal fortitude that you need to say, don't tempt me, devil. If you attack me, I'm going to go pray against you. If you attack me, I'm going to go do something for God. If you keep tempting me, I'm going to go witness to somebody. You keep tempting me, I'm going straight to prayer meeting. You're going to regret the day you ever brought that across my path. That's what Jesus did. He said, don't tempt the Lord thy God. Well, I can do that. I I can say, devil, get out of my face. I, I can do that. And so these are the ways that Jesus conquered these temptations on the same three battlefields. Now, again, if you put those on a chart, it looks like this. Jesus won where Adam and Eve had lost. Every temptation Jesus faced, it wasn't accidental or incidental. It wasn't coincidental. What the devil was doing, he was trying to defeat Jesus in the very same way that he had defeated Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. New Adam, same temptation. And the devil hasn't changed his strategy in 6,000 years of human history. He's still going to try to get you with the lust of your flesh. He's still going to try to get you with the lust of your eyes, and he's still going to try to get to your pride. He's going to try to make you think you know better than God, and you know better than God's word. And so we are not ignorant of the devil's devices, and if we'll just stand on the word of God, we can win on all three battlefields every time. But if we start questioning the word of God, if we start ignoring the word of God, if we start circumventing the word of God, that's when we start to lose the battles. Adam and Eve lost on all three battlefields. Jesus won on all three battlefields. And uh, I would suggest to you that both men and women fight on these same three spiritual battlefields all the time, every day. Both men and women can be victorious over the devil through Jesus' victory, But because we're different by God's design, we fight these battles differently. What does victory look like when you beat temptation? What does victory look like when you win over the devil? What does victory look like for a child of God? I'll tell you exactly what it looks like. It looks like something we call holiness. When a sinner who was unholy, begins through the power of the Holy Ghost to live a life that is holy, the devil's grip on them is broken, his power is diminished, and they get to walk out free. So every time you win on these battlefields, what it's developing in you is what we call holiness or sanctification. Now, holiness 
We talk about it sometimes, the apostolic church. A lot of people are freaked out by the word. It's a powerful, precious word. By the way, it's a Bible word. And, and if it's in the Bible, we do talk about it. The same as we talk about everything else that's in the Bible. And I would suggest to you that holiness, we think of it as a wall. It protects us from the world around us. Holiness isn't just a wall. Holiness is a weapon. Holiness is something that you can use against the devil in your hour of temptation. And, and it's, it's amazing. Now, now here's the scripture, and, and this is familiar. If you were part of the series we did uh, like way back at the beginning of 2016, I think, uh, the, the series Vessels of Honor, you're familiar with this scripture. Uh, Paul wrote to Timothy. Timothy is a young pastor of the great apostolic church in a very sinful mega city called Ephesus. And, and right here in this one little passage, we see very clearly, um, we see, see the distinction between men's standards of holiness and women's standards of holiness. And, and I'm going to be very quick because we've studied that. And if you have questions about this, there's that series. There's other stuff we can give you. Uh, and, and we'd love to, to answer your questions because people have questions about this. It's, it's different when you've grown up in the world and you're used to the world and all you've ever thought about is the way the world thinks. This is strange. And so it's okay for it to be strange or different or new. And we'd be delighted to answer your questions about this. I'm not going to take time to answer all your questions tonight. That would be a series, and we don't have time for a series. In fact, pastor's watching the clock, and we need to kind of head toward the end here. Uh, here here's what we see in, in Paul's writing to Timothy. I will, therefore, that men, everyone say men, pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. Before Paul ever talks to the ladies about what he'd like them to do, he addresses the men and says, men, you better shape up or ship out, basically. And then he says, in like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and, shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but instead of that, which becometh women professing godliness, they should adorn themselves with good works. Now, we've been through all of this, and this is not the Bible study tonight. We've already covered this. Uh, if this is new to you, we can get uh, this explained to you and give you some stuff that you can go through it and understand it more completely. This isn't the Bible study, but I just need to touch it here. If you read that scripture, you'll notice that men's holiness issues, and I find it amazing that God signifies three through the writing of Paul. Men's holiness issues are standards of action. Men act holy. And so here are some holiness standards for men. Number one, men, you get control of the appetites of your flesh. You are supposed to lift up holy hands and you can't lift up holy hands if you are consumed and overwhelmed and overcome with the lust of the flesh. And men struggle in this area much more. Uh, all the evidence says that. All the current studies say that. We keep trying to tell everybody men and women are exactly the same. Men and women are not exactly the same. Men are tempted differently than women. And so this is one area. And, and so everyone say appetite. Men get control of your appetites. You cannot come into the presence of God and lift up holy hands and lead your family in worship and prayer. You can't do that if your hands have been clicking on a mouse, looking at your computer screen last night, looking at stuff that's sinful and ungodly and wicked and lustful and perverted. You cannot do it. So men, don't you talk about the ladies and what they should do until you've got a handle on one of your holiness standards. And before we go too much further, notice this. Uh, without wrath, the way men deal with anger, that's a holiness standard for apostolic men. We don't talk about that nearly enough. It is not the will of God for you to be uh, a Mr. Nice Guy here at church and be friendly to everybody here at church and to be kind to everybody here at church and go home and be a brute to your family. That is not the will of God. You need a trip to the altar. You need a good repentance session. You need to make some apologies because you're not living as an apostolic man. Now, if you want to live as a worldly man, you can get angry. The prisons are full of angry men in Canada, in the U.S., and all around the world. But you don't have a right to call yourself an apostolic man and have an out-of-control temper, out-of-control anger. You have no right Right, because you're not living a holy life. That's one of your battlefields. It always gets really responsive when we talk about that. 
but it's true. And finally, Paul said, without doubting. Uh, men, you need to be very careful that the cynical, skeptical attitude that the world tries to put on men, that they doubt everything that's real and they doubt everything that's genuine and they doubt, doubt everything that's sentimental or emotional. There are, there are men that they have beautiful families and, and a wonderful wife and a, a, a great existence, a great life, and they'll turf it all. Because it's like they, their emotions are shut down. Paul said, you don't have a right as an apostolic man to live that cynical, skeptical uh, attitude of the world. You, you are to be a man who comes into the presence of God and you lift up holy hands. You get the appetites of the flesh under control and, and you get your anger under control and you get your stupid cynicism under control because that might serve you well in the business world, but it doesn't serve you well in the church. So before we go any further, I like the men that are in this room. I'm talking especially to the ladies tonight, but I like our men to lift up your hands right now and lift up your voice. Here's one thing the devil tries to do with men is he tries to silence them. That's how he was successful in the Garden of Eden. Eve is facing the temptation of her life, and Adam says absolutely nothing. Adam was silent, but apostolic men, we're not silent. It's our job. It's our responsibility. It's our holy calling to lead our families, our children, our wives in worship unto God and to get it right. So all of the men here, would you lift up your hands and would you lift your voice? If you're that brave, bold, bad man, then lift up your voice in the sanctuary and just give God praise in this room. I worship you, Jesus. I thank you, God, for our men. I thank you, God, for your calling on them. And I thank you for your hand on them. But God, we don't want to just slide by. We don't want to do minimums. God, let your holiness live in us. Let your holiness live in us. Now, here's something that's very unique in Scripture. And this throws a lot of people. And uh, especially today, I think. Because today we're wasting so much energy trying to tell everybody that men and women are the same except for their uh, physiology, which is totally untrue. We're created differently. But if you look in the Bible, you'll see that men's holiness issues, almost all the time men are commanded to act holy. And I guarantee you guys that the ladies have noticed this, that almost every time you look in Scripture, the ladies are commanded to appear holy. It's not act holy, although a woman can act unholy, let me tell you. And a man could appear unholy, but everybody would make so much fun of him that he'd shrink back into the, the house and, and fix it. But God knew we'd be tempted differently. And so here's what Paul says to Timothy to teach the ladies. Teach them to adorn themselves. Teach them how to decorate themselves. To do it in an apostolic way, not a worldly way. Teach them about their apparel. It should be modest, not immodest like the world. And then teach them about their attitude. It should be an attitude of shamefacedness and sobriety, which speaks of a woman's uh, submission. So, so here, here's the point. We've been here before, uh, but I want to use this as a springboard to my final point tonight. In Scripture, women are commanded to appear holy so that men will not be tempted to sin. And men, you don't get off scot-free. You're commanded to act holy so that women are not tempted to, to sin. And we are different in our temptation zones. And we are different in our battlefields because we're different from creation. And it's not just that. And this is what came so forcefully to me a, a month ago today when I was sitting in the airport and just writing these down as, as it came to me. And I've, I've never had anything come to me so clearly. And I hope I can explain it tonight as clearly as it came to me. This passage reveals to each gender not just three walls to put up. This passage reveals to each gender three weapons that you can use to defeat the flesh, to defeat the devil, to defeat sin, 
and to let holiness grow in your life. I am not pretending for one second that these are the only spiritual weapons we need. That would be ridiculous. We need prayer. We need fasting. We need sacrifice. We need all kinds of spiritual weapons. But these are powerful weapons, and I don't think it's an accident that Paul puts them together and, 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 and puts them opposite of each other uh, because these weapons, these walls, they're a, an external manifestation of what's going on in, inside of us. So, so let me put it on this chart, and, and, and let me just show you this. I think this is so amazing to me. John said, the lust of the eyes is one of your battlefields. Well, men, you've got to get your appetites of the flesh under control, or you will yield every time to the lust of the eyes. If you let your mind go and you let your emotions go and you let your lust go out of control every single time, you will yield to the lust of the eyes because that is one of your battlefields. But notice it's the same battlefield for the ladies. They still fight with the lust of the eyes, but they fight it in a different way because the world so unfairly tells women that you need help to be beautiful. Men, for some reason, get off scot-free. You get some 50-year-old man with a pot belly, and he's supposed to be okay, but you need help because you're a woman. That's patently unfair. But ladies, there's a battlefield for you because the world wants to attack you. The devil wants to attack you and say, you need to look like that to be beautiful. You need to look like that to be accepted. You look to, need to look like that to be attractive. That's not true. And so this is a battlefield. It's the same battlefield, but it works its way out differently for men and for women. With men, it's an internal battle, mostly. And with ladies, it's an external battle because the devil knew what our temptation zones would be. And then John said, there's the lust of the flesh. And, and uh, th this is what Jesus faced, and he won. Do you know what your flesh wants to do, men? Your flesh wants to get angry every single time that somebody doesn't do what you want. Your flesh wants to get angry every time your life doesn't turn out just the way you planned. And, and an angry man is not only self-destructive, but he's destructive to everybody that comes anywhere close to him. And so th this is the way that men face this battle because a man's uh, flesh, his human nature, his carnality wants what he wants when he wants it. And that's just a, a masculine, selfish thing. And apostolic men, you don't have the liberty of letting your anger run unchecked because you don't have the right to get everything you want all the time. You're Jesus' child now. You're an apostolic man. Now, the battle's the same, the field is the same, the battle uh, ground is the same, but ladies, uh, the lust of the flesh works its way out differently in ladies. Uh, there, there's a battleground here, and, and that battleground is the way she apparels herself or she clothes herself, and, and modesty, it defeats the lust of the flesh. And, and you've noticed this, if you're new at CCC, we're so glad you're here, but you've noticed that our ladies... They dress differently than what you might see in the mall or what you might see somewhere else. Definitely what you would see uh, anywhere near a beach. Although, thank God in New Brunswick, that's not a problem for more than two days a year. <laughs> this is Felicia Delta. She's not a Pentecostal. I don't even think she's a Christian. But, but she said this, Felicia Delta. She said, manipulating a man's attention for the purpose of your affirmation is how women are tempted to lust. When, when a woman tries to manipulate a man's attention, she adorns herself or she dresses in a certain way to try to get his attention for the purpose of her feeling affirmed or her feeling attractive or her feeling sexual or whatever. That's how a woman is tempted to lust. Now, she's not an apostolic. She just, she just has some understanding. And so, ladies, uh, when, when you are modest... When, when you have a spirit of modesty, what you're doing is more than just a dress code. What you're doing is more than just putting up a wall. You're using a weapon to defeat the lust of the flesh because your flesh wants to be approved and wants to have affirmation and wants to have the world look at you and think, wow. And so that's how a, a woman there is no benefit or blessing. There's no um, favor from God because you don't care how you look. 
God's not talking about not caring how you look. Um, homely is not holy. So we're not talking about like dress in a sack and, and just, just like put on a frown and, and impress everybody with how holy you are. That doesn't help anybody, especially not you, by the way. We're not talking about that. Some of the prettiest, most attractive, beautiful ladies are ladies who have this inner sense of, of modesty and, and godliness. But it's more than just a wall. It's a weapon. It defeats the devil on this battlefield right here. I don't have to be uh, looked upon like the women in the world want to be looked upon. And then finally, um, I, I just think it's amazing how this all uh, lines up. Women and men both fight one final battlefield, and it is the pride of life. And the pride of life, it comes out in men with this apathetic, cynical, you know, I'm in control, I'm in charge, I don't sweat it out, I, I'm just, I, I'm in control, and, and you can't move me. And, and we see it sometimes in church, and it's, it's really sad when it gets a hold of a younger uh, man. And the earlier it gets a hold of a, of a man, the more destructive it is. And sometimes you'll see a young man that he, he just uh, bottoms out spiritually. And it's almost like he comes to church with his arms folded in that steely glare. And it's like, I dare you to try to move me, pastor. I dare you to try to move me, worship team. I'm not moving. And what that is, is that's that apathetic spirit that so easily takes hold of a man. And really, it's just pride. It's pride. I'm going to prove that I'm in control. I'm going to prove that nobody can move me. I'm going to prove that nobody can make me cry. Nobody can make me budge. And it's that proud pride of life attitude. And men can go down for the count so easily on that battlefield. It's, it's unreal. But ladies, there's a way that uh, that battlefield affects you. And it's in your attitude of submission. Um, it's, it's so important, and people don't like to talk about submission because they think it puts people down. They think if you talk about submission and you reference women that you're putting women down, and, and that's why I spent a while building this foundation tonight. Jesus didn't put you down, ladies. Jesus lifted you up and set you free, and he wants you in his eternal kingdom. So he's not putting you down. He's setting you up. He's lifting you up. He's, he's freeing you. And... Uh, Holiness isn't just a wall. Holiness is a weapon. And, and this last one, and, and again, if you're new at CCC, uh, we don't expect you to understand this all in five minutes. We'll take time, and you can take time to figure it out, study it out, think it through, and, and make decisions about it. And we love you whether you ever do it, ever get it, or, or whatever. We just love everybody here, and we welcome everybody. But you've noticed and you're important to us, and this is important to us, so it's only fair that since you're important to us and this is important to us, that every once in a while we at least mention it because you've already noticed this is true. In, in our church, you've already noticed that our ladies all have uncut hair. They have this long, beautiful hair, and, and you've noticed that. And I just want to explain why. We don't condemn anybody that doesn't. We don't preach against anybody that doesn't. But we just feel like we owe you at least an explanation because other than that, it's just weird. It's like, why do you do that? Well, here's, here's why. The Bible teaches a woman to have an attitude of submission. Listen carefully. If you don't hear anything else I say, that is not because she's inferior to men. Jesus taught and the church taught that women are not inferior to men. A woman is submitted to her husband because God created them in that order the man and the woman, the husband and the wife. Please notice that nowhere in Scripture does it say that women are supposed to be submitted to men. Not there. And so if anybody ever tries to tell you that women should be submitted to men, women should be seen and not heard, or any of that stupid stuff, you, you need to tell them that that's not in the Bible. And if they think it's in the Bible, go find a reference because it's not there. Women are not supposed to be submitted to men. They're supposed to be submitted to their husband. It's a particular man in a marriage relationship because the marriage is a picture of Christ and the church. Submission does not mean subservience. Submission does not mean she does all the work and she's the servant and you sit back and wait for her to come fan you. That is not submission. 
under authority, ladies, does not mean without authority. Under authority actually gives you more authority. When you're submitted to God's word and God's plan, it actually gives you more spiritual authority. And so there's this beautiful passage in 1 Corinthians 11, and it's a famous passage in the Bible about uh, this whole idea of headship and submission and authority. And Paul weighs in on it and tells us how this particular battlefield, this attitude of submission, how it's evidenced in an apostolic woman's life. And he talks about, strangely enough, what she does with her hair. And this is why we do what we, we do. This is, this is why. Uh, so, so just let me explain why we, why we do this. Um, Paul says, ladies, your hair is given you for a covering. It's given you to serve as a covering. 1 Corinthians 11, uh, verse 14 and 15, it talks about that. And when he says, uh, your long hair is the way he phrases it. Your kome hair, K-O-M-E is the way you'd pull it into the English from the Greek. Your kome hair, your, your uncut hair, your hair that is allowed to grow, it is given you to serve as a covering. Why does a woman need a covering? Well, it's because of this place in God's order of creation. But that's not what I want to talk to you about tonight. I want to pull back to this scripture because in verse 10, he says this, for this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Um, This is an incredibly important verse. This is an incredibly important concept. And it, it has to do with these battlefields that we fight on. And ladies, you have a secret weapon in this battlefield against the pride of life. There's nothing more powerful than a submitted, godly, humble sister in the body of Christ. And she might look like she's the weaker sex. That's what we say. She's not the weaker sex. Uh, She can knock the devil down when she goes to prayer. And and so uh, this is what Paul talks about. Now, there's two words, two major words for power in the New Testament. Uh, First, First of all, there's dunamis. In Acts chapter 1 verse 8, it says, and you shall receive power. You shall receive dunamis after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And, and you'll go and be witnesses to me. Well, dunamis is the ability to do things uh, beyond our natural ability. Uh, the gifts of the Spirit operate out of dunamis power because we can't give a prophecy or we can't give a message in a, a language that we've never learned. But through dunamis power, through this doing power of the Holy Ghost, we can do it. So that's dunamis power. But there's another kind of power in the New Testament. Every bit is important, and it's exousia power. And exousia power is mentioned in John 10, verse 18, where Jesus said, I have the power, we'll talk about it on Sunday, I have the power to lay my life down, and I have the power to take my life up again. I have the power. That's not doing power, that's restraining power. It's power to hold steady when hell is attacking. It's power to stay put and do the will of God when the devil, the world, and everybody around you is trying to pull you off course. And Jesus said, while my body is crying out for relief on the cross, I have exousia power. I have the exousia, the power to stay on the cross. I can lay my life down and I can pick it back up again. He had restraining power, exousia power. And that is power to restrain yourself. And this is where, ladies, you bring such an incredible power to the apostolic church. Because Paul said there's exousia on your head because of the angels. Because you are submitted, you have restraining power given from God on your head. It rests upon your life, and the angels recognize it. The holy angels recognize it, and the fallen angels recognize it. They were there in creation. They know how creation got messed up. The fallen angels helped mess creation up, and so they know exactly what's going on. And when a lady who is submitted to God in this beautiful covenant, 
covenant of separation through what she does uh, by not cutting her hair. This is why we do it. it. It's not weird. This is why we do it. It's in scripture. She has restraining power on her head. She has authority in the spirit realm because of the angels. And when a lady like that goes to prayer, there's an unbelievable power and blessing and anointing that's released. And so I, I want to stand here again as a pastor. Uh, we, we love everybody everywhere. And we've got lots of people that come to our church that are brand new Christians. And we give them years to develop and grow and learn. And we're not expecting anybody to do anything just because a pastor said. But what we do wish for you and what we do hope for you is that you'll read the word of God on your own. And when Jesus convicts you, when Jesus teaches you, you'll just kind of fall in line with the word of God. And there are beautiful benefits to doing this. And one of them is what I'm talking about tonight. Because we all face war on the same three battlefields. And for a man, he's got to get the pride of life under control by checking his cynicism at the door and checking his apathy at the door and not being ashamed or embarrassed to lift his hands or shed a tear or, or lead his face family in worship. And for some men, that's a huge struggle. And the devil tries to twist him and say, you're a man. You shouldn't be weak like that. You shouldn't serve God like that. You shouldn't worship like that. You're a man. Be a man. And all that is, is the pride of life. And men, you've got to beat that enemy on that battlefield. But ladies, there's a similar pride of life issue. And it's when a lady, when she just decides that I'm going to be my own person, I'm going to do my own thing. I'm going to raise up and I'm going to do what I want and what the world says and what feels good. There's an opposition to that. And it's this beautiful spirit of submission that for every godly apostolic lady, she says, I don't have to do that. I'm not submitted to you. I'm submitted to God. I'm not submitted to the world and its fashion and what it tells me. I'm submitted to God. And the Bible says, in the words of Paul, she has restraining power on her head because of the angels. And she wins the battle over the pride of life by her beautiful power of submission. The three battlefields, they're the same for each of us, but we fight them differently because we're male and female. Exousia pictures a woman praying in the posture of no. She's restraining the enemy. She's restraining the devil. We received a powerful word from God through Pastor Matt on Sunday night um, about backsliders, about continuing to pray because we haven't seen the end of the story. Ladies, could I tell you that your prayer posture when you are submitted to God is a posture of no. It's a posture of restraint. It's a posture that says, devil, you have no right to come into my life. You have no right to come into my family. You have no right to mess up my kids. You have no right to take my heritage, my grandchildren. You have no right to do that. And so while a man, he has a, an offensive posture, a woman has a defensive posture in prayer. It is so powerful and we need it so much in the church. And it's amazing to me, and I'm closing, that so many Christians see some of these passages in the Bible as trivial or unnecessary when they have such deep and profound meaning. But I come back to where I started. The apostolic church isn't looking around to take our cues from culture. The apostolic church takes our cues from the word of God. Ladies, the devil has been fighting women longer than he's been fighting anybody else in the Bible except for God. The devil's been fighting women since Genesis 3, verse 15. The battle between the devil and women is the oldest battle in the book because the devil is afraid of a woman who's submitted to God. He's afraid of what godly women bring to the church. He's terrified of what a godly mom brings into her home over her family because women have a special understanding about spiritual warfare that all of us men really don't have. And it's because of the birth process. 
If you have the Holy Ghost, the Bible tells me in the words of Jesus in John 7, 38, he that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And I've said it before in this pulpit. That is not belly as in stomach, as in food. That is belly as in womb, as in birth. And so if you have the Holy Ghost, you can pray in the Holy Ghost and you can birth something in the supernatural. But here's what the devil knows. He knows that women understand that because of the birth process way better than the men do. And about the time the men are giving up, getting ready to go to Tim Hortons, the ladies have just locked in to this intercessory groaning prayer and they push and they deliver something in the supernatural. And that is why the devil is terrified of a woman who understands that she has a unique way to win the battle on the three battlefields. Holiness, ladies and gentlemen, is not just a wall that we've built around the Pentecostal church, built around apostolic saints to keep us in. It's a wall that keeps the world at bay, but it's even more than that. It is a weapon that we use to push back against the encroachment of the enemy. It's not a bad thing to have a weapon to fight unholiness. It's not a bad thing to have a weapon to fight unrighteousness. And it works itself out differently. But wouldn't you say we've all got some work to do on these things? All of us have some progress to make on these things. And so right now, I'd like the men and the ladies in this church... I'd like you both, if you would, together to lift up your hands and your voices, and I'd like you to pray. I'd like you to hook on to where we were Sunday night. Some of you were praying so powerfully over your family, and we don't have Sunday night music, and we don't have Sunday night uh, emotion, and we don't have Sunday night emphasis right now, but what we do have is the Word of God that was here Sunday night, and I'd like you to begin to pray just like you did on Sunday night. You say, well, Pastor, I haven't seen anything since Sunday night. No, because we're burning birthing something. And so every once in a while, you just have to push one more time. Every once in a while, you just have to uh, give it one more effort in prayer. Every once in a while, you just have to say, God, I'm standing on your word. I'm not standing on my emotion. Ladies, if you would, I'd like you to stand right now. Whether you have ever heard any of what I've taught tonight, whether it's brand new to you, it doesn't matter. Everybody together, all the ladies, I'd like you to stand. And I'd like you to lift up your hands over your husbands, over your children, over your grandchildren, over your moms, your dads, your sisters, your brothers, over your husband especially. I'd like you to lift up your hands because when a godly woman prays, you feel that. There, there's a great power released. She's not wasting her time living a holy life. She's not wasting her time obeying the commandments of God. There's incredible power that rests on her head. There's a, a restraining power that rests on her head. She can push the devil back because the devil recognizes her authority. And now, man, I don't want you to check out because you have a role as the priest of your home. I'd like all of our men to stand up, and I'd like you to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubting. And I'd like you to pray, and I'd like you to push. We, we don't let the ladies do all the heavy lifting spiritually around here. We've got good godly men that know what it is to work in the spirit and to pray in the spirit and to go after it in the spirit. We're not in competition one with another. We fight on the same three battlefields. We might be different. We might fight differently. But we're in the same battle. Thank you, God, for apostolic truth. And thank you for apostolic lifestyle. And thank you for apostolic teaching. And thank you for apostolic understanding. And most of all, God, thank you for apostolic power that rests on your people. We're not perfect, but we're striving to be a holy people. We don't have it all together, but we're striving to be righteous because you've called us to be a righteous people in an ungodly world. We don't have our act all together, but Jesus, we're so far 
far from what we used to be. We're so far from the old bondage we used to be in. And we thank you for freedom. Thank you for your blood. Thank you for your spirit. Thank you for your word. As you're praying, that's so beautiful and powerful. Would you turn your attention specifically on the backsliders you're praying for? Specifically for the backsliders you're praying for. The the backsliders you were praying for on Sunday night. Back up and give that another push in the spirit on Wednesday night. I believe God is going to do something incredible in our midst this year. There's going to be many backsliders come back to God. There's going to be many backsliders find their way to an altar. But but it's not going to happen unless God's people insist that the devil let go. Insist that he loosen his grip every place that the sole of your foot treads. God said, I'll give it to you, but you've got to fight for it. God, hear our prayer. Hear the prayer of a godly mom. Hear the prayer of a godly dad. Hear a prayer of a godly wife, a godly husband. And Jesus, right now, there's somebody in their family that's not serving you, and it grieves them in their heart. They've shed many tears. They've been so confused. They've been hurt emotionally. And God, they don't understand. But Jesus, help us lift up our eyes above all of that and to believe you for a revival to believe you for an in gathering to believe you for prodigals to come home in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name